Okay, folks. Become less disorderly. So we're about to start the ceremonies, which a number of you are interested in. So you may want to pay attention. I don't know. First off, let me say, is everybody having a good time? Thank you all for coming. We have tried to find, as always, a Toastmaster that is worthy of the occasion. This year we have Dr. Chell London. He is the leader of the 44th and 45th expedition to the International Space Station. So we have... So we brought you guys a real live astronaut, and here he is. Thank you so much. Uh, I was a flight engineer. I was not the leader. I just uh, I want to make that clear. So, <laughs> my wife uh, claims that my career choices have been uh, defined or driven by how comfortable the clothes um, for each of those careers were. And so, when I joined the Air Force, it was so that I could wear a flight suit, um, medicine in the emergency department, uh, so that I could wear scrubs, and then um, NASA again, so that I could wear a flight suit. Um, you all look fabulous tonight, and because we do not have formal wear in the astronaut uh, corps, I essentially get to wear my pajamas, so <laughs> thank you, NASA. Well, it is um, great to be here at uh, this year's CIFWA conference, and it was fun to learn that it's pronounced CIFWA. I feel like I'm more of an insider now. Uh, and I was delighted to learn that much thought and consternation went into uh, the acronym, the letters, and the pronunciation. And that it's not SAFWA or SAFAFWA, it's SIFWA. And uh, you all, I am sure, are aware that I come from an organization that takes great pride in its acronyms. Um, our very name, NASA is an acronym, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And a huge part of the learning curve for when we join uh, NASA as astronaut candidates, or affectionately known as ASCANs, uh, <laughs> is learning that new language of, of acronyms. And so we have acronyms that you pronounce. TDRS, the Tracking Data uh, Relay Satellite System. And acronyms that you don't pronounce, like, the, uh, like EVA, or Extravehicular Activity, is not EVA. Uh, EMUs, the extravehicular mobility units, are not EMUs. <laughs> we have acronyms inside of acronyms, like SAFER, which is the Simplified Aid for EVA Rescue, or jetpacks. And then sometimes the acronyms are unintentionally, um, unintentionally hides the intent of that which is being named. And so uh, someone starts out with a really cool word that they want to name their project, and then they build backwards. And, uh, and this, of course, is very confusing to the crew member that is, now has this tool and has no idea what it is. It's just named something cool. And so we provided feedback and just say, hey, hey, let's just name the scope meter the scope meter. And we'll all know what we're talking about. Um, we occasionally uh, obfuscate with, uh, with, a, uh, with an acronym, um, occasionally to make the crew member feel better. And astronauts do not wear diapers. We wear mags, <laughs> maximum absorbency garments. <laughs> and that's important because some of us have fragile egos. <laughs> well, I am absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, I have to say this has been an amazing experience. Uh, many of you have commented on how it feels to meet an astronaut, and I am giddy with getting to meet uh, you all. You are world builders, creators of realms in which I spent countless hours as a lonely kid in high school or as a medical student looking for, uh, looking for escape. You all created those worlds and have, uh, have helped at times to explain this one. And so you can imagine that it is more than a little intimidating uh, to be a Toastmaster in front of a, uh, an audience of eloquent wordsmiths whose work inspired you to become an astronaut. And yet uh, you all have all been incredibly kind, welcoming, and encouraging. 
So thank you so much. I. Now I recognize, and I think most astronauts recognize what a unique privilege um, that we have been afforded. The opportunity to fly, to live, and work in space. Now I recognize how special that is, especially in this community. I've gotten to experience some of the wonder that we all dream about and that you all uh, eloquently describe. So it's been an absolute delight to share that experience with you uh, over the past couple of days. I appreciate your enthusiasm, uh, your interest and your questions, and I hope my answers have been an encouragement to you as you have been an encouragement and inspiration to me and to so many others. On the space station during my downlink with Sasquan, I spoke of how we at NASA are turning science fiction into science fact. And we are. Now we may not be moving as fast as some have envisioned, uh, but we are living much of the future described by the dreamers and writers of the past. We have been living and working on the International Space Station for 16 years now. We have robots doing work all over the solar system, and we are preparing for our journey to Mars. And now, yeah, woo. <laughs> and now, you all are describing futures for our scientists and engineers to realize. Some of you are describing the dystopian darkness that we must strive to avoid. The sandbox that you build in is altogether amazing and frightening, breathtaking and devastating, entertaining and enlightening. And it has been a joy these past few days to meet and talk with those of you who play in that sandbox. And I know that uh, writing for many of you is a passion. Uh, for some it is a way to pay the bills. And for some of you, there is a hope that it will someday be a way to pay the bills. <laughs> but whatever your motivation, please do not underestimate your power to inspire. I am here today because of the power of science fiction. So reading, and more specifically, the speculative fiction that inspired me to pursue this path are so important that I like to say that my path to space was paved with books. So important that I put a book at the foundation of my Expedition 45 mission patch. Now I take every opportunity to impress the importance of reading on the kids that I talk to at schools and on my own children, and I'm delighted to say that I have a family of bookworms. We are particularly enamored of science fiction and fantasy, and I'm grateful to be able to attend this conference, to participate in this community, and to listen to your, thought, your insights and experience. This job is particularly delightful because of the community created by the powerful emotions, memories, and dreams that so many associate with spaceflight. Many of you have shared with me your recollection of watching the moon landings as a child, or watching a rocket or a shuttle launch in person, or how you experienced the Challenger disaster. Many of you have visited a space center or have a relative or friend that works in the aerospace industry. And I love hearing these stories. And it struck me as interesting how much we desire to share those insights and connections and to establish our role or our place in things that are bigger than ourselves. And so I'd like to turn the tables and share with you some of my insights and perspectives um, from my mission to the International Space Station. Now, I'm definitely not the wordsmith in the room, so I'm going to cheat and use some photos for my mission. All right. So first, I'm going to share with you the books that inspired me when I can't. Uh, these are the very first books that I remember reading outside of like uh, Go Dogs Go and um, the Cat in the Hat, so let's see. So has anybody read The, the Runaway Robot? That is the first science fiction book that I read, and that set me on a path. And then Saber Jet Ace uh, is a nonfiction book about uh, Joseph McConnell, an uh, ace during the Korean War, and so this really set the trajectory for me. Um, But what I would like to do is actually share with you some perspective and insights from my mission. And so uh, I am a physician by training, and so I have uh, organized these anatomically. 
So insights, perspectives from the head, from the feet, from the gut, and from the heart. So this is a photo of me from uh, at the end of my second uh, spacewalk. Um, it is a selfie, or in my case, it's a chelfie. And so this is uh, my entree into perspectives from the head. Uh, so living and working um, in space, that is my favorite part of this experience on the International Space Station, truly adapting to that weightless environment. Growing up in gravity, we all, it was interesting, we spoke about this in, in one of our recent panels, we all grow up with a, a gravity bias, and it's very hard to shed that. So things that we expect or do down here, we take that with us to the internet, to, to, to low Earth orbit, um, even when the environment uh, suggests a different way of doing things. And so one of those things that we would do on Friday nights is that we would all gather together, our crew would gather in the Russian segment of the space station, and we'd have dinner together and spend a couple of hours just sharing our experiences from the week. And then on Saturday nights, we invited our Russian colleagues over to the U.S. segment and, uh, and had movie night. And so here's a, a picture of movie night. It's a little dark, but uh, we were all gathered in node one. We had the projector pointed to a big screen, and I think in this case we're watching The Martian. So in space, in weightlessness, I can float in front of you upright and be completely relaxed. I can fall asleep in that position. In fact, that's what we do in our sleeping bags and our crew quarters. We are upright, feet towards the ground, head towards the, the, the heavens, and that's perfectly comfortable. I can fall asleep in that upright position. And yet, to enjoy a movie, apparently you have to bungee or hold on to something so you are in a sitting or lying back position. <laughs> And honestly, if to float and watch a movie is uncomfortable. You feel like you're not relaxing. Um, so every single person is, is forcing themselves to sit down to enjoy this, uh, this, enjoy this film. Another thing that I think is really remarkable about that weightless environment is um, just this concept of uh, innovation. And I think innovation um, in this respect comes from experience and intentionality. That you have to have experience in an environment, understand that environment, and then you have to be very intentional about innovating, about thinking about how we can do things better. And so I was scheduled one day to work on Robonaut. So as I said, I am a physician. I'd spent uh, many hours in the operating room holding retractors for the surgeons. And this is how you do surgery, and this is how this particular procedure was prescribed. It was to have Robonaut bolted down to the ground and to put on our personal protective equipment, open up the chest and then to work inside the thorax there uh, for repairs on Robonaut. And that made sense to me. This is, that is the, the model that I am familiar with from the OR. Well, Scott Kelly, has, uh, I, was up, I had the great privilege of flying with Scott Kelly while he was doing his one-year mission. He had been up on the space station for three months when I arrived, and prior to that, he had already flown a six-month mission and a couple of space shuttle missions. So he's had a lot of time in space, and he made a very... Um, big point about constantly trying to improve. And so when it came Scott Kelly's turn to work on Robonaut, he asked, hey, can I put Robonaut on the wall? And so all he had to do was basically he had Robonaut sitting right in front of him, right in front of his face, so all of his work was done right here, whereas I spent the whole time, um, there's no gravity to pull your torso down, so that's activating my abdominal muscles for the two, three hours that I was working on Robonaut. And then I got a backache as a result of that as well because, you know, I'm, I'm bending over. And Scott's floating right in front of Robonaut uh, to do his work. And so I thought that was a remarkable demonstration of, hey, how can we change the work environment to make, um, to do things smarter in this environment? So those are some, some insights from the head. Now insights from the feet. Okay, so. You've already eaten, so fair warning, if you are grossed out by feet or have a feet foot thing, then close your eyes or leave the room, okay? So when we get up and walk around on Earth, we compress several layers of skin. Uh, at the bottom of our feet. 
and, and that builds up over time, and friction and pressure then create calluses. And so we all have calluses at the bottom of our feet as a result of just getting up and walking around. In space, you, do, you no longer walk on your feet. And so all those layer, this layers of skin decompress. And what that means is that over time, all of that skin sloughs off. And so the, those calluses slough off. In fact, uh, one of my colleagues in a previous mission did, had not been briefed on this, didn't know that this was going to happen. And part of his heel callus like came off in a big chunk, and he called down like worried that his foot was falling apart. <laughs> okay, so you're, this is last warning. Here it comes. So, so these are my feet. It's about uh, three months into the mission. And then the, the, the one on the right is actually right before I return home. And that one actually, I think, looks a little worse. But in fact, the skin on the bottom of my feet and that on the right side are baby, soft, and smooth. Um, and, and all that, uh, that skin actually came off uh, in my first shower, and that was pretty gross, too. <laughs> but what this means is that when you take your socks off, is that you have to be really careful. You slide the sock down your leg slowly, and then you capture it at the end, and you tie it in a knot, and you stick it in the trash bag, and you close it up. Because if you just grab the top, and you just go, zoom, and fling it off, you are flinging like this big old cloud of foot skin everywhere for everybody. And that is not being a good crewmate. You don't want to expose all of your friends to floating foot skin that they're breathing in and they're getting in their mouth. It's very disgusting. So take care of your crew. You could almost say that calluses migrate. And here's another issue. So the calluses disappear from the bottom of your feet, and they move to the top of your feet. And that's because um, in order to stay in place to do work, we hook our feet underneath handrails. And so that's how you have a stable foundation with which to do work. And so you develop calluses on your instep at the top of your foot. OK, enough feet. Let's go on to something more interesting, gut. Insights from the gut. OK, it's not going to get gross, or not too gross. Not that kind of a gut. It turns out, if you Google space and guts, that there are actually images that you can use for, for a talk like this. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing what you can find on Google. Um, food is incredibly important. We know it's important here on the Earth, um, and it's just as important in space. It's how we get nutrition. Um, but it's also psychologically important. We use food to celebrate. We use food to commiserate. And uh, so when Thanksgiving rolled around, the ground told us, hey, uh, there's a special Thanksgiving meal for you. Um, you need to go find it because we'd like to do a PAO event uh, on this, a public affairs event. And we thought, special food, that is awesome. You guys sent up a special Thanksgiving meal for us. Um, where is it? And, uh, and then the reply came back, oh, actually, we made a mistake. There's no special meal. We need you to build a Thanksgiving meal out of your rations. And so, and we were at the end of our rations, so it wasn't in there. So we actually had to go scavenge from, like, next week rations and pull the good stuff out of there to build this meal. So it was kind of a double whammy. So this is our delicious uh, Thanksgiving meal. We've got uh, smoked turkey, um, potatoes au gratin, some corn, and then this is uh, candied yams, which is terrible. <laughs> the truth is, uh, after three weeks, I'm sorry, three weeks, three months, five months, six months in space, the food lab does an amazing job of trying to provide um, nutritious food that tastes good. But the bottom line is, when you've been eating the same thing over and over for, for multiple weeks, that it starts to get old. And so we started sharing recipes on hey, if you mix this with that, you get this, and it tastes, it's interesting. And so <laughs> you, you really seek out variety. And so you start mis mixing some weird stuff together. Um, one of my favorite mixtures is not that odd. It was taking our dehydrated strawberries and putting it on breakfast waffles. And so, so this was a Saturday morning treat for me. It's and it's floating, which is pretty awesome. 
We also um, include in our bonus, we have bonus containers, and so these are food items that we get to select. And, uh, and, and for a couple of those bonus containers, I actually s selected Russian food. The Russian food is actually pretty good. So we, all of our food is low sodium to keep, you know, to keep us healthy. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't do a whole lot for the taste. And, uh, and so the Russian food is appropriately salted. Um, and there's things like meat and potatoes and jellied fish. Uh, it all tastes great. It all interestingly really tastes like the same thing. So I don't know how fish and beef and sausage all taste the same, but uh, it tastes good. And you really can't do much better uh, than this. This is uh, Zapuska Appetitnaya, which is appetizing appetizer. <laughs> So that is always a treat. <laughs> During uh, our mission, we got to grow lettuce. This was the, we were the first American crew to grow and get to eat a crop in space. And so uh, we grew red romaine lettuce, which was phenomenal for those gardeners in the audience. Of course, there is a psychological benefit to gardening, and that was wonderful to do on the space station. And then to, to eat it at the end felt a little weird because there was this thing that you were, of course, pouring your efforts into and then and then you ate it, but, um, but, we, but we really wanted fresh food, so. Uh, so we got to eat the lettuce at the end. I put it on a faux cheeseburger, um, and so that was pretty good. And a faux cheeseburger is a tortilla, because we don't use bread in space because of the crumbs. Um, so a tortilla, rehydrated beef patty, uh, cheese whiz. And, and it actually, it's actually pretty good. And then I'm, a coffee freak, and so I, the coffee in space is actually pretty good. It's dehydrated. Um, Kona, so I had half sweet Kona with cream. It was wonderful, uh, but I thought I was going to really miss fresh brewed coffee. So I schemed ahead of time and had some pods of coffee set up, sent up on a cargo vehicle in my, um, in my care packages. I mounted those on the top of our capillary beverage cup. I took hot water off the galley and pushed it through the uh, the pod into the coffee cup, and, and so I am claiming the first uh, first pour over in space. <laughs> Invention is the mother of necessity, right? Is that right? Is it back? Did I say that backwards? Necessity is the mother of invention. All right, there we go. I feel really bad that you guys are standing, having to stand here while I'm doing this. All right. Um, okay, so those are insights from the gut, insights from the heart. It is said that you can't see borders from space. And so there are some bummers uh, from the experience on the International Space Station. Looking down at the Earth and not seeing borders, especially during the day, um, but then at night hearing news coming up and all the terrible, way, terrible things that we do to each other. And when you look at the Earth, and you look down, especially when you're going over war-torn countries, um, and you recognize this finite planet that we live on, and you, you just can't help but wonder, why can't we figure out how to do this and, and get along? Um, and so that is, uh, that is very difficult uh, to look back at the Earth. And, and, uh, and see this, beautiful, um, this beautiful, beautiful planet that we live on, but to recognize the conflict and strife uh, that, that you can't see. You float over amazing, uh, these amazingly beautiful sights like this atoll. And so I took a picture of this to tweet, um, but when I sent the tweet down, or sent the, the photo and my message down to the ground, um, they actually said, yeah, we're not gonna tweet this. And I said, why? Said, well, it, it is beautiful, but you know, I was going to say something about these these boats sheltering in an atoll, um, and it turns out this is actually one of the islands that's being militarized in the in the Southern Pacific, and so that is disappointing. The Earth at night is absolutely amazing; it is absolutely stunning, and uh, really reveals where our populations gather. And uh, and so this is a photo um, of an island. And you see these beautiful cities. Uh, if you look at the, let's see, you look in the, off on the coast, you see these cities out here, and then you realize, oh, actually, those aren't cities. That's ocean. And those are fishing boats that we can see from, from space, which is amazing. 
But then you realize that this isn't an island, that this is actually South Korea. And that if you go down to the bottom left, that this is North Korea. And I'll show you over here. So North Korea is right here. And those countries have, I think, roughly the same populations, and yet one exists in almost complete darkness. Many people ask me, hey, can you see the Great Wall of China from space? And I'm not sure where that came from, but apparently uh, it is, um, it's something that we're supposed to be able to see. And I say I could not even see Beijing from space. And that's because of uh, the terrible pollution in some parts of, uh, of continents. And so you can see this mountain range, and off to the left, this just uh, tremendous haze that really blocks our ability to see um, much of, of uh, particular continents. And pollution is, has a very clear character. It's this yellowish haze. It's very different from clouds, very different from just general smoke. And then affecting those of you who were in Sasquan last year, or I'm sorry, a couple of years ago, um, we can see forest fires from space. And they are tremendous, I mean, very clear and tremendous. And so these are, these are pictures of the, f the fires over the Northwest um, while you were all at, at Sasquan. And so it's very clear that there's something uh, very wrong going on. Um, we know that people lost their lives in these fires. And it's, a, it's absolutely amazing. This smoke stretched from the northwest. You could see it stretch all the way across the continental US. Uh, pretty amazing. So that's kind of a downer. But it's not all, um, it's not all downers uh, living on the International Space Station. There's some amazing things as well. The Earth is beautiful. So just water. So flying, if you stick your head into the window and look back at the Earth, chances are pretty good you're going to see some water, of course. But just the character of water, I mean, the intricate to etchings um, of wind and, uh, and currents on the water's surface as it reflects the sunlight is absolutely beautiful. The clouds are amazing. And this is one of my favorite pictures and most confusing. I looked out the window, and you can see these fluffy clouds on the right, and then it looks like somebody's dragged a, a giant rake down the left with this incredibly striate line and then these... Uh, striations in the crowd, clouds to the left, and the clouds are incredible to look at. Clouds in a hurricane are also incredible. This is a picture of an eye of a hurricane that my crewmate Kimi Ayui took. And, uh, and looking at a hurricane, you understand the massive power that is, uh, is wrapped up in this storm system, and yet as you fly over it, it just looks perfectly still and peaceful, and yet you can see you know, that it's progressing to populated areas, and that is, uh, uh, that, that's very scary. The ground, particularly Africa, is absolutely amazing. Um, so just the differences in color and geography. I thought this looked like an Escher, uh, Escher drawing. These dunes are incredible. Um, and then uh, I sent a note down to the person who's doing social media for us on this particular picture. And so as kind of a shout out to, to, uh, to Dune, I said, I, the, old, the, the tweet just said, Arrakis, question <laughs> mark. And so the guy that was helping me out, he spent a good hour and a half looking for Arrakis on, <laughs> on Google Earth. <laughs> he's, so he wrote up, he's like, I can't find Arrakis, Chell. And it's like, I am so sorry. <laughs> on so many levels. These crab-like, uh, these crab-like dunes, and then uh, this valley in Africa just looks like a watercolor painting, um, absolutely stunning. And so then we go from dry to wet. Oops, it's incredibly lush ground, and then rivers. I thought this river looked like chocolate milk. I think I was having food cravings at this point. <laughs> we can see the the Great Barrier Reef um, bordering. Australia, and one of the really cool things, um, flying over the upper atmosphere, we can look down and we can see contrails made from planes just crisscrossing um, the atmosphere, which is really amazing. And if you find the tip of one of those contrails, what I would do is just take a picture of the tip of it, and then I would blow it up, 
And you could actually, so I actually took a picture of an aircraft in flight um, from the space station, which is amazing. And in addition to aircraft, we took pictures of spacecraft in flight, which is, again, blew my mind. We, as we passed over the top of Florida, the Cygnus cargo vehicle was launching to catch up with us and deliver cargo to us. And it was twilight, which makes it very difficult to see through the upper haze of the atmosphere. But uh, we were just looking out the window just to see if we could see anything. And sure enough, as we passed over, we could see this bright dot climbing through the atmosphere behind us and chasing us. And then we could see this amazing like cobra hood of uh, as the, the contrails of the rockets spread out through the atmosphere. And so this is a picture of that, that uh, Cygnus cargo vehicle chasing the International Space Station, which is just mind blowing. The only thing that gave me goosebumps during my mission uh, was the Aurora. This haze of neon green with highlights of purple and red rapidly undulating over the, the face of the Earth um, was absolutely stunning. I was also getting elevated radiation doses during this time, so <laughs> that's where the goosebumps may have come from. <laughs> and then finally, um, the view of the Milky Way is, uh, is stunning. And, and so in this particular picture, uh, we happen to capture a lightning strike on the ground that's reflected on our solar array, which is uh, just great. And then it was time to come home, and my last and favorite picture of the Earth and its, uh, and its star um, is one of my favorite pictures of, of all time. So those are some insights from, from the head down to the feet to the gut and uh, from the heart. Um, is an amazing experience. Uh, thank you for sharing in it. Thank you for inspiring um, just legions of folks to, to look towards the stars and, uh, and to chase their dreams. Thank you so much. Thank you. And in the spirit of full uh, going full circle, um, I leave you with an acronym. Not many Star Wars people in the audience. All right. Okay. All right. I think that's it for tonight, right? Okay. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, let's get on with the show. So uh, the awards, first uh, former president Michael Capabianco will present the Kevin O'Donnell Jr. Service to CIFA Award. Back down to earth, unfortunately. But the Kevin O'Donnell Service of Civil Award uh, it was created to honor those volunteers who uh, go beyond, above and beyond the call of duty for CIFWA. As you probably all know by now, CIFWA is primarily a volunteer organization. And without volunteers, many of our services, perhaps all of our services, and perhaps the organization itself would cease to exist. So I'm going to. Um, put on my glasses. Um, and let's see. Um, I'm going to say that I'm extremely pleased uh, to present this year's Kevin O'Donnell Jr. Service to Civil Award to Jim Fiscus. And uh, I will just briefly say Jim has been volunteering for CIFWA since the mid 90s. That is, as we have to keep reminding ourselves a very long time. Uh, he's chaired various uh, committees, including the Orphan Copyrights Committee. Uh, he's currently chairing the, uh, the Contracts Committee, and uh, he's co-chairing the Legal Affairs Committee. Uh, in my, I've been working with him for many years now. He is the mainstay upon which many of these committees exist. He is responsible for revising these extremely complicated, either legal or uh, contractual uh, 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 drafts of model contracts that we produce. And I certainly encourage all of you to go check them out on the uh, CIFA website. Our model contracts are, are great, in my opinion. Um, we also submit things to the uh, Copyright Office and the House Judiciary Committee 
the Librarian of Congress, we've been uh, working to do these things. And an additional, uh, also uh, amicus curiae, not amicus curare, uh, well, I have to, <laughs> briefs, uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to comment on various cases uh, in the legal uh, uh, sphere, um, mainly related to copyright, but also other things. Um, let's see. I, I can't think of anybody who's more deserving of this award. Um, as I say, he's been a mainstay. Two of, two of SIFWA's uh, goals or mission uh, statements are to defend and advocate for authors. And Jim is the mainstay of that effort for, for many years. And, and I really will enjoy giving the award to him. So Jim, could you come forward? fit in the suitcase. Uh, you'll have to fit it. I'm it sorry. will, it will. We were talking about whether this would fit in the suitcase uh, to get it on the airplane, and it will. <laughs> Very nice. I'll put it up here. Um, you have to have your priorities. You have to be able to get it at home. A <laughs> um, couple of very brief notes. Uh, I want to thank the board and the board members and committee members I've served with over the years, which was a considerable privilege. A couple of thoughts just pontificating for a second. The relationship between writers and the people and businesses who publish our work is at its base adversarial, especially when it comes to contracts and money. Writers need decent pay for their work, they need fair contracts, and that means not allowing overbroad grabs of rights it means reasonable warranty and indemnity clauses, payment on or before publication, fair accounting, whether it be from a publisher or from Amazon. For anthologies and books, it means payment of royalties if the book succeeds. It is Sephora's primary job to fight for writers, and I urge you to volunteer and to stand in solidarity with your fellow writers. And that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, next, uh, Brianna and Frank Wu will present the Ray Bradbury for Outstanding Dramatic Presentation Award. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that is not nearly a big enough chair for the Nebula Awards. Come on! That's, uh, that's amazing, Frank. Uh, <laughs> before we start, I have to say, Dr. Lindgren, I have a promise for you, and that is, you know, after I'm serving as your congresswoman in 2018, after the elections, America is going to renew our funding for NASA, and we are going to make sure you have everything you need over there. That's very important to me. Yeah. Come on over. Amazing. So, you know, this is such an honor. This is an amazing time to be a science fiction and fantasy fan. It's amazing. Every single week there's something amazing that's coming on TV. You can't even watch it all. And, you know, I was talking to Frank before this. I was thinking, like, what if they had this category back in 1995 for the Nebula Awards, and you were having to give an award that year. The number one sci-fi film that year was Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. <laughs> that was the year Waterworld came out. Like, it is, it's just, it's an embarrassment of riches these days. All right, so the 2017 Ray Bradbury Award for Outstanding Dramatic Presentation. The nominees are 
I have no eyesight left. Arrival, directed by Dennis Villeneuve. Screenplay by Eric Heisser. I love this one. Doctor Strange, directed by Scott Derrickson. Screenplay by Scott Derrickson and Robert Cargill. Yeah. Wait, which one am I on? Kubo and the Two Strings, directed by Travis Knight. Screenplay by Mark Hames and Chris Butler. Amazing. All right, I like this one too. Um, Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Directed by Gareth Edwards, written by Chris Weitz and Tony Gilroy. All right. Oh, this one's awesome too. The Bicameral Mind, episode of Westworld, directed by Jonathan Nolan, written by Lisa Joy and Jonathan Nolan. Yeah! That was a good one. Yeah! And, oh my gosh, this one's great too. <laughs> Zootopia, directed by Byron Howard, Rich Moore, and Jared Bush. Screenplay by Jared Bush and Phil Johnson. All right. Wow. All right. So All right, Frank, you ready to do this? Yeah, what? Wait, you have the envelope in your purse. Right? Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> okay, there let, you me, go. let me get let me get go. Go. Oh my god! Oh no! Oh, my god. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> Which envelope is it? I think it's this one. No. Nope. <laughs> that's it. That's nope. it. Is this it? Yeah, okay. That's, that's the right one. Okay, and the winner is La La Land. <laughs> that that doesn't sound right, does it? No, I don't, no. Think, I don't no. think that's the right one. Okay, hold on. Um, sorry, sorry about that. There you go. Oh, wow! <laughs> the real envelope is blue. <laughs> and the winner for the Ray Bradbury Award for Outstanding Dramatic Presentation is... Arrival! <laughs> It's amazing. We have an acceptance speech. So Arrival isn't here tonight to, uh, to accept this awesome award, which I think means we get it. Um, but I, uh, they did have a speech, a letter they wanted me to read to you. Uh, thank you to everyone for honoring me with an award named after the man who got me named, uh, hooked on science fiction as a child. This means so much to me, and if I were not on location making another film, I'd be here now with you. Enough cannot be said about the people who made this film a reality, starting with the brilliant and evocative writing of Ted Chang. <laughs> Dennis Villandu shaped the script into something truly cinematic, while Amy Adams filled a role and created a new category of acting non-linearly. I'd leave you with a bit of trivia. The words of General Shang's wife on her deathbed were a source of much anguish for me. As Dennis had made it clear, he believed that they were the most important in the whole film. Quote, this is what saves the world, Eric, end quote, he had said to me. So after weeks of sending him options, he finally fell in love with the line, which was then translated to Mandarin for Amy to speak into the phone. Imagine my frustration when Dennis decided not to use subtitles in the film. <laughs> but just so all of you at home know, her words were, in war, there are no winners, only widows. Thank you very much, Arrival. I think you need to clean up your mess. Oh, oh, the other the ones that didn't win. Yeah. <laughs> All right, the next, the Kate Wilhelm Solstice Award is presented to individuals who have made a significant impact on the science fiction and fantasy fields. This year, SIFWO will be honoring two individuals. Bill Fawcett will present the first Kate Wilhelm Solstice Award. Now, it's really satisfying to be giving the Kate Wilhelm Solstice Award. I've worked in law groups, I've worked with major corporations. They don't have awards for contributing to everybody in being a good person. 
We do. It says some pretty nice things about all of us here. Compared to them, our nastiest fandom spats are love fests. <laughs> And it's really been a privilege for me for many years to do it, and it's a great privilege for me to be able to present this to some one of two people, both of whom are wonderful people and really deserve such an honor. The Kate Wilhelm Award's been given out to many people since it was inaugurated in 2008 with Kate Wilhelm himself, of course, Martin Greenberg, and Algis Prodris. Since then, it's gone to Don Walheim, Tom Doherty, great fields, figures in the field, Artists like, <clears throat> excuse me, Mike Whalen, and even scientists like Carl Sagan. And today, it's a very great privilege to honor to someone who has got a lot of years yet to come doing it, but has been a, a tremendous positive force in our field and a positive force for an awful lot of writers that she's affected. Officially, she is Antonio Catherine Flora Weisskopf. Tony, can you come up, please? It would be a process of hours to go over everything Tony's done for everybody in various <laughs> things. Oh, by the way, I only thought it was fair to have you up here so that not only can they see you react to this, but you're in punching range. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps just giving you an idea of her life and some of the things that have gone on in it and what she's been doing in various places will help explain why we all feel it's privileged to honor her with an award for all she has done. Born in Massachusetts, she moved to Brooklyn the age of three, and was there until 12. And I have it on good authority that you were more of a mystery reader in those days. Yeah, and mystery romances. And rest mystery romances, of course. Her father, if you don't know it, by the way, moved her to Huntsville, where he is the chief scientist on the Chandra X-ray satellite, and has been for many years for the whole project. So she sort of grew up among us. She prepared from the beginning of her life at Oberlin College to work with writers. She took anthropology. <laughs> Tony, for all her successes, only successfully had one job interview. She went straight to Bain Books from Oberlin a few years ago. Beyond... <laughs> Beyond her other efforts and things that I, we are all grateful for, she probably created the anthology with the title I really, really am jealous that Harlan didn't make. The only one, Greasy, Grimy, Gopher Guts. <laughs> her reverence has been both apparent and a great help to many of us because she's willing to look in new doors and then laugh at it. While at Bain, Tony was always thinking about how things went and how the books, no matter what was going on. Uh, probably the best example of this is a memo that we all got from her. Tony had an abdominal operation. Now, when I had kidney stones, I complained to everyone about the pain. She was in pain. That isn't what happened. Tony sent us all a memo that said, from now on in any Bain book, no one's getting shot in the stomach and doing anything but lie there writhing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. If you look at the books ever since. Tony was one of the early advocates and inspirations in the e-book process back in the 90s before they were making us all a lot of money. She's one of the reasons that e-books became so popular. She and Jim were putting together things like, let's give some away and see if people start to like them projects when most of us were deathly afraid of the whole concept. Ip Bain is editor and publisher. It's one of the... Uh, not very dirty little secrets. Tony's a nice person. She's a soft. I can't tell you, <laughs> except when negotiating a contract, I can't tell you how many people she has helped, how many contracts have been rushed out on April 14th, 
how many medical bills have been covered because two more books worth of contract came in, how she's been patient, how she's helped people with problems. They've put a few writers on salary to get them over bad spots. <laughs> she's a, and then, of course, there's the ounce of blood part, but that's later. <laughs> One small child. <laughs> yeah. On her finish side, Tony, because being, of course, an editor and a publisher is never something to keep you busy, Tony has put together from the beginning a fanzine with, by the way, one of my favorite uh, novellas, I guess it would have been called, titles, Ying V is a Louse, from that great story plus X. Yeah, and wonderful things like that. Tony has worked with fandom as much as she's worked in our profession and on other levels all of her life. Back in 93 and 94, you put together the definitive book on all of Southern fandom. At, um, well, I won't say it was hard, but they have two awards that they gave her that year. One was the Rebel Award for contributions, and the other was the Rubble Award for having driven them all crazy. <laughs> Later on, Tony was also, because of her many other contributions in 2002, or, um, given the Phoenix Award as well during that. She is the only person to get all three big Southern awards as a fan. Incidentally, a Tucker in 2007, the Liberty Con Hank Reinhardt, named for someone she knew, in 2009, and the Fleur de Fan in 2015 for her general contribution. So a lot of us have noticed this. And if this wasn't enough professional activities and contributions to make, she's also on the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop Committee and helps organize it. Tony contributes a lot. On a personal note, she is, very importantly, the doting mother of Katie. Do not, do not play money in hearts or scrabble with her. <laughs> and finally, if not the most important, one of the most endearing, she is a lifelong Cubs fan. <laughs> and it, it meant a lot to us both. <laughs> so, for so much and so often, and for more contributions than there, and for putting up with this speech. <laughs> Congratulations, Tony, you more than deserve it. Well, I'm always amb ambivalent about awards as an editor, um, because there are so many other people uh, who deserve uh, credit for what it is that you do. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank uh, you all, the members of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, um, Kat and the Board of Directors, uh, for giving me this award and for letting Bill introduce me. Um, I will keep this short, I promise. Um, and most especially for placing me in such good company, especially this year. Um, I knew Peggy Ray Pavlet, and I really wish that she were here tonight so that we could celebrate together. Um, and talking about coming to Bain, it was 30 years ago, almost to the day, that I came to New York, straight out of college to work for Bain Books. I wanted nothing more than to follow in the footsteps of John W. Campbell and Frederick Pohl, and to be paid to read, to read science fiction. Um, and so far, so good. <laughs> uh, it's been my honor to work with the finest writers, the most talented artists, the best editors in the business in all that time. Um, and uh, for ebooks, the credit goes entirely to Jim Bain and Arnold Bailey. Um, I was just there watching them going, oh, yeah, <laughs> well done. Um, so I, I work with the finest team there is, and I'm really, really proud of them. Um, I'd like to thank, in particular, the editors of Bain that I've worked with, past and present, including Jim Bain, um, Josepha Sherman, Betsy Mitchell, and the current team, Marla Ainspan, Jim Minns, Tony Daniel, Danielle Turner, Joy Freeman, David F. Shara-Red, and Christopher Rocchio. Um, and I'd also like to thank our, uh, our core of incredible freelancers, um, 
I will only call out three by name, but they will stand out for the millions who, uh, who have worked with us. Uh, Modine Moon, Bill Ledbetter, and Kelly Lockhart. Um, it has been a great ride, and I hope I get another 30 years. Thank you. Now, uh, Kate Baker and Stephen H. Silver will present the second Kate Wilhelm, Wilhelm Solstice Award. When I attended the 2008 New York reception uh, in my first year as CIFOI event coordinator, we were setting up the registration table, and uh, Peggy Ray Sapienza was there, and she looked over at me, and she looked at what I'd done, and very gently suggested that, well, this would work better over there, and that would really be a lot better if it was over here, and why don't you go grab a drink? Well, I put everything the way it should be. It was the beginning of a long and wonderful friendship and partnership that saw the two of us co-chair multiple Nebula weekends and work together on several New York receptions. Peggy Ray McKnight was born into science fiction. Her father, Jack McKnight, manufactured the first Hugo Awards during Philcon II. Peggy Ray Pavlet made many contributions, creating the Worldcon concourse, professionalizing Worldcon's press offices, and eventually chairing my first Worldcon in Baltimore in 1998. Through it all, she had the ability to look at an individual, quickly figure out what their strengths were, and welcome them into the sphere of minions to help her achieve her lofty visions. Now, I began working for CIFLA a few years after Stephen in 2011, and from my arrival, Peggy Ray made me feel welcome, part of the family. And that's before I had even done anything for the organization. Um, she gave me advice as I settled into my role and offered to help on a wide variety of topics, not only relating to the Nebula Awards, but in every way SIFA could be made a better organization. She was always encouraging everyone she met to be their best, and it's a skill I try to emulate with my own teams now, and I miss her so much for that. When Peggy Ray wasn't working on the Nebula Awards or some of her other conventions, many other conventions, she proofread the CIFA Bulletin, making sure CIFA was able to produce a professional magazine. She was always there, ready to help whenever asked, and by helping, improved whatever project she worked on. CIFWA is proud to present the Kate Wilhelm Solstice Award to Peggy Ray Sapienza, but the real tribute CIFWA offers her is this weekend, which exists in its current form, almost entirely based on Peggy Ray Sapienza's vision. John, would you please come up? promised I will keep this short, but I would like to say that I'm grateful to Bill for his tribute to Tony for her efforts in fandom. Um, we think of Tony as producing books that we all love to read, but both Tony and Peggy Ray put in lots of hours and lots of love in helping people come together and join with others in our genre of science fiction and fantasy. It was her gift to the community for which she is honored tonight. Thank you all very much. One more thing. In 2012, thanks to Steve <laughs> and Kate and others, Peggy Ray was fan guest of honor at the Chicon 7 convention, and she told me afterwards that she felt loved. I'm sure she would say the same thing tonight. 
and I'm very grateful for the love you've given. Thank you all. Okay, next, Fran Wilde, the winner of the 2015 Andre Norton Award for Young Adult Science Fiction and Fantasy, will present this year's award. I'll keep this short. The Andre Norton Award for Young Adult Science Fiction and Fantasy nominees are The Girl Who Drank the Moon by Kelly Barnhill, <laughs> The Star Touched Queen by Roshni Choksi, <laughs> The Lie Tree by Frances Harding, <laughs> Arabella of Mars by David Levine. Railhead by Philip Reeve. Rocks Fall, Everyone Dies by Lindsay Rybar. Rybar. <laughs> the Evil Wizard Smallbone by Delia Sherman. I've never gotten to open an envelope before. <laughs> The Andre Norton Award for Young Adult Science Fiction and Fantasy goes to Arabella of Mars. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank everyone who read, nominated, and voted for Arabella for this award, whose name honors one of our finest. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge all the other very worthy nominees. I'd like to please give a hand to the other nominees. <laughs> Especially Rocks Fall, Everyone Dies, because that title. I'd like to offer special thanks to Moshe Fetter, who acquired the book, uh, Christopher Morgan, who edited it, Patrick Nielsen Hayden, who provided invaluable support, Paul Lucas, my agent, uh, copy editor extraordinaire, Deanna Hoke, thank you very much, Deanna, Mary Robinette Kowal, my invaluable guide to all things Regency and navigating the dangerous shoals of publication, to Jana Silverstein, my greatest advisor and cheerleader, and most of all, my late wife, Kate Ewell, who never stopped believing in me. Pittsburgh was Kate's hometown, and she would have been so very proud and happy to share this moment. I wish she could be here now. I still love you, Snooky. Thank you. Now to present this year's Damon Knight Memorial Grandmaster Award, Kat Rambo, President of CIFLA. Many of us came to science and fiction and fantasy because of that book, which varied in title, but when we read it, it opened new doors, it showed us new worlds, and it became a lifelong passion. While all writers are admirable, those who create those gateways are the ones who bring in our new readers, our new fans, and the people who become our new writers. One of the joys and terrors of the CIFA presidency is trying to pick the next CIFA grandmaster and find someone who represents the genre, who has shaped it, who has helped create it, and who we feel represents the field. This year, I picked someone 
who writes those books, who brings new fans, who brings new readers, who opens new worlds. A woman who has written close to 300 books over decades of a wonderful career and too many awards to really name. And so I'm going to bring her up to speak for herself. Our next SIFA Grandmaster, please join me in greeting Jane Rowland. No, this is extraordinary because I speak all the time and I am shaking up here. So, um, I'm going to be very short. I hope they send that to me because I can't possibly get that back in my suitcase. Um, first, I want to thank you, Kat, um, and all the past presidents, of whether they cast a yay or a nay vote for me. Um, <laughs> there are reasons the Grand Master Award exists and the present. President uh, nominates the, uh, the person that he or she wants. The others advise and either consent or dissent. And everyone hopes the old writer doesn't die before the award is given. <laughs> um, honestly, though, it was an absolute and complete surprise to me. Normally, think of this, as a past president, I have a vote whenever this award comes up. Um, but. There is not an award every year. So if I had thought about it at all, I guess I assumed this was a no one being named this year because I didn't find out who was running. <laughs> now, you may think that it was very ingenuous of me or stupid, uh, but it never occurred to me. And Kat sent me an email that she wanted to talk to me about a SIFWA matter. Uh, and I thought she was sounding out um, several of the past presidents on something. We, that's how we did it. And, and I thought maybe this was, well, puppyish. <laughs> or maybe some money problems. Or a new category for membership. You know, we get these calls every once in a while. So we made a phone date that suited us both. It took a bit of back and forth before we got one. And then she called. And I said in a jolly manner, Hi, how can I help, Kat? And she said, um, what would you say if I told you uh, that we want to name you Grand Master? And I laughed and said, <laughs> right, really. Um, what can I really help you with? And she said, no, really. And I said, well, I'd probably tell you you couldn't get enough votes. And she said, we already did. <laughs> at which point, I was possibly for the first time in my entire life at a loss for words. I mean, that puts me on the same list as Ursula and Isaac and Clark. And so I reached into the joke bag, because that's all I had. I said, do I get a chalice of gold? No. Um, a sword and buckler with my name engraved? No. A crown with sparkling jewels. No, but you get a free trip to Pittsburgh. <laughs> Exotic. And she said, a standing ovation. <laughs> so thank you. You, you, made, you didn't make her liar out of her. No, OK, she really didn't say that about the standing ovation part. But here I am in Pittsburgh, and I'm honestly, honestly gobsmacked. Um, and a bit teary, uh, and um, I'm about to go all Sally Field on you in a moment. And if a woman had to lose the election, at least another woman has become a grandmaster of SIFWA. <laughs> you understand, we're not breaking any glass ceilings. This glass ceiling has been broken before, but I'm glad to pick up some of the shards. Now, I hope you don't think this means I am done, finished, 
uh, my writing over. Next year, this is going to surprise you because of what you said just a minute ago. Next year, my 365th book will be, uh, and the 366th as well, just in case it's a leap year. And <laughs> this means you will be able to read a Jane Yolen book a day for an entire year. But that's only if you can find all the out-of-print books. <laughs> um, so no rest for me, or as it turns out, no rest for you either. Um, though possibly I can rest a bit now on my laurels, except, except I am on a list with Ursula and Isaac and Arthur and Chip and Jean and Joe and Harry and Michael and Damon and Jim and Harlan and Annie and Silver Bob and Ben Vaughn and Philip and Ray and Alfie and Blessed Andre and Brian and Paul and CJ and Hal and Lester and Fritz and Cliff and Sprague and Connie and Larry and Jack and Mr. Heinlein and I've probably forgotten someone or said other people twice. Uh, <laughs> but what, what could be better than that? I think you like me. I, I honestly think you like me. I was, I, was, I was going to say, oh, and Kat, a bit of dark chocolate couldn't go amiss, but two, pe two big things of it showed up in my room this morning. So, um, so instead, instead of saying that, I want to read you a verse that I wrote this morning. Um, let's see, I've never done this on my cell phone, so let's hope it works. Um, it's called Grandmaster Advice. I've been a grandma for 22 years, changed diapers, gave cuddles, and often wiped tears. Grandmaster for Sifwa, a moment or two, sans crown and sans sword and sans duties to do. No writers wear diapers. Maybe <laughs> astronauts. I didn't think of that. <laughs> no, no writers wear diapers need cuddles, though fears of rejection can bring on a flood of fresh tears. So maybe my duty is easy to see. You need some tear wiping? Then come here to me. I love you all. Thank you so much. Okay, and now we would like to take a few moments to remember members of our community who are no longer with us. Please hold your responses until the end.
I'd like to invite uh, Kat Rambo back up to the stage. We do have uh, one more little surprise for Jane, and I would like to bring Walter Day up to the stage to present it to her. Jane, can we bring you up one more time? I think many of you have seen Walter's amazing science fiction trading cards, and so one of the things that we did this year was make sure that we had a trading card for our CIFA Grandmaster. And so here to present it is uh, Walter. So I actually have to marvel that I'm here on the stage tonight because the person sitting beside me, uh, Jonathan Brazzi, uh, he suddenly volunteered that his first science fiction story he ever wrote was Starman's Son by Andre Norton. And I said, well, that's what I read too. First one I ever read. And uh, somehow D in my DNA, science fiction's there because my uncle Bradford Marshall Day opened up what might be history's first science fiction bookstore in Queens, New York in 1959. So that goes pretty far back, I think. But anyway, I do trading cards. And when I tell people I do trading cards, they get confused at first and they say, well, oh, you mean baseball cards. So we're gonna put you on a baseball card tonight. And, and, and it's true, you know, back in the 1860s and 70s, business people would make trade cards. They'd mention their trade on one side, and on the back they'd have a flower, they'd have a fish, <laughs> something like that. Then eventually baseball became so popular, they started putting baseball people on the back and it grew into what eventually became baseball cards today. So I would like to believe, since baseball cards were kind of an American phenomena, I would like to believe that as I present this to you tonight, that up here on the stage with us is the spirit of Babe Ruth. <laughs> and Lou Gehrig, and Joe DiMaggio, and Mickey Mantle, and Ted Williams, and Roger Hornsby, and dozens of others, as they all join us as we welcome you into the long, long American tradition of being a prominent figure who's honored for their career on a baseball card. You won't be surprised, but I wrote a book about Honus Wagner. <laughs> and he was the one, the one baseball star at the time who refused to have his his um, picture, and he he told them to take it take it off because on the back of them they were selling um, or they were sold in sold in cigarette packs, and he didn't want children to be smoking, so he he refused. So I wrote that story. But if you can find a Honus Wagner uh, baseball card that got away, it's worth something like two million dollars. So this one won't be that. I'm sorry. <laughs> We do have another card to give away. This is to another one of the figures of our community. This is going to come as a complete surprise to them, which I'm happy about. Stephen Silver, could you please come up here? It's not often I get to actually surprise Stephen, so I'm very <laughs> pleased by this. So this is well-deserved, Stephen. <laughs> so, so Kat and I worked at keeping this a secret, but I do have in my bag over there a big, thick wad of Stephen Silver trading cards, and we can, I'll hand, we'll start handing them out. <laughs> and. Uh, one last thing I'll say is that the famous company Beckett that used to grade, you know, grades Mickey Mantle cards and puts them in those plastic cases, they recognize these trading cards now, so we have to get Stephen in one of those Beckett things, and, uh, because those four different universities that have big archives that preserve science fiction memorabilia, they officially have announced that they want to start collections of the science fiction trading cards graded by Beckett, so it's a very prestigious development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Walter. Thank you.
Okay, tonight's robotic centerpieces have been graciously loaned to CIFWA by Don Jones and Jones RoboWorks. If you'd like to adopt one of these cyber cybernetic marvels, Don will be selling them following this evening's presentations. They are beautiful. Okay, the Nebula Award for short story will be presented by incoming CIFWA director, Andy Duncan. So am, am I correct in that they decided to let me to present the first Nebula Award of the evening? I think so. Well, uh, any short fiction writers in the house? Short fiction writers, unite, testify. Okay, very good. I, uh, I was advised to keep it short. Um, and, uh, well, I can cross off the La La Land joke. <laughs> Thanks, Wu. <laughs> uh, they don't want me to gush about Twin Peaks on Sunday night. That's not why we're here. Long anecdote about things Scott Edelman has fed me, no. <laughs> Long analysis of the speculative fiction elements of Smokey and the Bandit, no. That's not why we're... Talk to Leo Vladimirsky later. Long anecdote about Connie Willis's long anecdote, no. <laughs> long anecdote about foot calluses. <laughs> Thanks, Lindgren. <laughs> no, I, I think it's safest just to get to the awards. Uh, particularly given my accent, our, our former president, John Scalzi, used to demand that I travel with a translator. Um, uh, which did, uh, w and Sydney is with me tonight, I'm very glad to say. And Steve Silver was going all around, uh, not realizing he was about to be immortalized on a baseball card. He was going all around to all the presenters, coaching us through pronunciations of, of everybody. And then he came up to me and went, never mind. <laughs> so, so we're on our own. But this, but this is a peer award. These seven stories are stories that we all decided are, the, are exemplary of what we want to do. These are stories we wish we had written. These are stories we will point to for years to come when we say this is the sort of thing we do when we are at our best. And so everybody on this list that I'm about to read should be extremely proud of that, right? <laughs> so the nominees for the Nebula Award for short story this year. Uh, from Uncanny Magazine, Our Talons Can Crush Galaxies by Brooke Bolander. <laughs> From The Starlit Wood, uh, Seasons of Glass and Iron by Amal El Makhtar. From Clockwork Phoenix Five, Sabbath Wine by Barbara Krasnoff. From Clark's World, Things with Beards by Sam J. Miller. From Fireside Magazine, This Is Not a Wardrobe Door by A. Merck Rusted. <laughs> From Tor.com, A Fist of Permutations in Lightning and Wildflowers by Alyssa Wong. <laughs> and from Lightspeed, Welcome to the Medical Clinic at the Interplanetary Relay Station, Hours Since the Last Patient Death, Zero. <laughs> by Caroline M. Yoakum. And the award goes to Seasons of Glass and Iron by Amal El Makhtar. I, I 
wrote notes and this thing is closed, so I can't open it. Um, <laughs> sorry. This is really uh, this is really something, and I'm very uncollected. And hi, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I really should have prepared for this better, um, but you can't, because how can you, right? Like we have this whole. Uh, alternate universe speech thing, which is supposed to help you prepare for things, but you have to imagine yourself in the alternate universe where you win the award in the first place, and uh, it's difficult. So, um, and and lots of things about this have been difficult. Like getting here was hard, and being here was a little hard, and this just makes it all worth it in weird ways. And thank you. Um, I have to thank um, my amazing, amazing editors, Nava Wolf and Dominique Parisien, um, for basically holding the door to their anthology open as long as possible as I blew past deadline after deadline after <laughs> deadline. Um, and to, I have to thank my wonderful husband who is here with me and who is so amazingly supportive through absolutely everything. And even though he wants me to be writing novels and I'm not doing those yet as fast as he'd like, I have to thank uh, Max Gladstone for, for helping me crack the story open in ways that it really needed. Um, and I thank to Uncanny Magazine for reprinting it and letting it reach a wider audience. And most of all, I have to thank my tiny, amazing, less tiny now than she was then, niece, Lara West, for asking me to tell her a fairy tale and for making me realize that I wanted her to have better fairy tales than the ones that I knew, and so I had to make something up for her. And thank you all so much for reading it and nominating it and, and voting for it and, and being moved by it. Um, thank you, thank you so much. And thank you to Sifwa, oh my god. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you so much to the board. When I say getting here was difficult, I, I came across a border to get here. And it was hard, and it was upsetting and bad, and I was detained, and things were bad. And um, But I wouldn't have even tried had I not been able to talk to members of the board beforehand to ask them about what can I do if I'm not allowed to cross? What can I do in terms of like stupid, niggly logistical things if I'm not allowed across the border to accept potentially an award? And they were enormously, incredibly helpful and supportive with this, and I cannot thank you enough for that. So thank you so much for enabling me to be here and for, for giving me this beautiful thing. I've never had one before, so thank you. <laughs> Okay, the Nebula Award for Novelette will be presented by Jeffy Kennedy. When I first got to be a CEFWA member, to my great astonishment and joy, one of my first assignments for Writing for the bulletin was for the Nebula edition, and I got to write interviews for Best Novelette, a category I had not known existed. <laughs> I was a novelist. I knew about novellas. I knew about short stories. I did not know that there was a novelette. And so I asked people, why would you write a novelette? And the answers were fascinating to me because it was, as you would imagine, a combination of, well, it wasn't quite enough story for a novella, but too much for a short story. And so it ends up being this fascinating form that's a little bit interstitial. And as an interstitial person myself, I greatly appreciate that. So I'm very excited tonight to be able to present to you the nominees for Best Novelette. We have from the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, The Long Fall Up by William Ledbetter. <laughs> Published in Lightspeed, 
we have sooner or later everything falls into the sea by Sarah Pinsker. Published in Beneath Ceaseless Skies, Blood Grains Speak Through Memories by Jason Sanford. Also in Beneath Ceaseless Skies, The Orangery by Bonnie Jo Steffelbeam. In Tor.com, the Jewel and Her Lapidary by Fran Wild. <laughs> and in Uncanny, You'll Surely Drown If You Stay by Alyssa Wong. <laughs> and, and I have to admit, this is my first time for ripping over, open an envelope, too. This is like the best part, right? <laughs> And the winner is The Long Fall Up by William Ledbetter. <laughs> and this is for you. It's a lot better than the pictures of them. <laughs> Um, well, I guess it's good that I wrote something down. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I've been reading and loving science fiction since I was a kid over long, long years. Um, and I've watched with wonder and appreciation as the stories grew ever deeper and more complex ex explorations of human condition. During that whole time, nebula winners have been leading the charge. So I'm amazed and humbled to join this list with a hard science fiction stor space story that is hopefully entertaining and tries to explore some of those difficult issues. While writing is inherently a solitary endeavor, most of us don't accomplish much without help. Right? So I have some people to thank. First of all, I want to thank everybody who, who read and liked and voted for the story. Uh, the readers are always the most important factor. Um, and SIFWA, especially, you know, for for doing all this and for letting me be a member. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, need to, I need to especially thank uh, Charlie Finley and Gordon Van Gelder at Fantasy and Science Fiction for believing in the story without whom uh, it never would have reached so many people. And I have an awesome support network of trusted friends who've always helped me lift my stories to, to higher levels. Um, uh, so a huge thanks to everyone who spent their time reading and giving me feedback on this, especially everyone in my future classics writing group. Uh, and a special thanks to the steadfast Michelle Munzler, who's read this story like three or four times before it ever went out to a publisher. <laughs> and my amazing wife, Denise, who, without her support, I could never have become the writer that I've, I've grown to be. So, thank you. Okay, the Nebula Award for Novella will be presented by Kevin McLaughlin. Hi, um, I'm new to CIFA, so thank you very much for this. This is really special for me, in no small part because the novella is probably my favorite format for fiction, period. I've watched it go from something that almost died away to something that's really experiencing a massive resurgence, and I love the form, so this is incredibly exciting for me. The finalists for the Nebula for Best Novella, we have Runtime by S.B. Divya. <laughs> the Dream Quest of Velet Bow by Kij Johnson. The Ballad of Black Tom by Victor Laval. Every Heart a Doorway by Shannon McGuire. The Liar by John P. Murphy. 
and A Taste of Honey by Kai Ashante Wilson. All right. First time opening an envelope for me, too. We're doing a whole bunch of these tonight in a row. And the winner of the Nebula for Best Novella is Every Heart a Doorway by Seanan McGuire. bad test anxiety for awards, so I mostly spend these things throwing up, and this is the first time I've actually won one, so I feel like the five pounds I've lost was worth it. <laughs> um, everyone at Tour.com has been amazing. Uh, when Lee Harris contacted us and said, hey, uh, we'd like you to write a novella, and you don't have much time to do it in, so I'm not going to tell you what I want. Just give me 40,000 words and we'll be good. I, I kind of went, okay, this is the best deal ever. <laughs> Um, and I, he's not here tonight, but I wish he were. He's been an amazing editor. Everyone at the team has been uh, absolutely amazing. Everyone, every, I really did not think I was going to have to do this. Um, I threw up on my speech, so I recognize that's gross, but it's also true. So, yay! The dog ate my homework. Um, this story has meant a lot to a lot of people in a very short period of time, and I know that because they keep reaching out to me and telling me so, and thanking me for putting them on a page where they could see themselves. And I think we all deserve to be on a page where we can see ourselves, no matter who we are or what we are or what we do. And I want to thank everybody here um, for everything and for voting for me and for putting up with me occasionally streaking by in the hallway with a hand clapped over my mouth like I was going to go out a window. Um, I do want to thank my girlfriend Amy who puts up with more of this than any of you and my PAs uh, Kate and Vixie who literally get me calling them at 2 a.m. sobbing hysterically because there's a typo on page 16 and I'm going to die. Um, so tomorrow I'm going to go to the aviary and hug some owls. Thank you so much. <laughs> I used up all the Emesis bags when I first got to the space station, so. It's true. <laughs> it got better. So the final award of the evening is the Nebula Award for Best Novel, and I have the privilege of, uh, of announcing the nominees. So many pockets. All right. The nominees uh, for the novel, from Tor and Titan, All the Birds in the Sky, by Charlie Jane Anders. <laughs> from Saga, Borderline, by Michelle Baker. From Orbit US and Orbit UK, The Obelisk Gate by N.K. Jemison. <laughs> From Solaris US and Solaris UK, Nine Fox Gambit by Yoon Ha Lee. <laughs> and from Tor, Everfair by Nisi Shaw. And the winner of uh, the novel, Nebula for Novel is All the Birds in the Sky by Charlie Jane Anders. Thank you so much. Thank you. God. You guys, I'm going to need a bigger sock drawer. Um, 
I'm sorry, I'm just starting a timer. Okay, uh, first of all, I want to take a leaf from what David Levine said, and, and can we, that was an amazing slate of Best Novel nominees. Can we get a round of applause for all of them, please? I'm just so honored to be on that list. Um, I, I'm so incredibly grateful for this award and for um, the, the generous reception this book has received and just how much people have opened their hearts to it. And I spent three years arguing with the voices in my head that said everybody was going to hate this book. And it wasn't because it was like too risky or challenging or too many genres or whatever. It was because the voices in my head were saying, um, you're, not, you, you're not good enough to write this book. You, you don't have enough skill. You may never be good enough, but you definitely are not now. You should stay in your lane. And um, I'm just so incredibly grateful to everybody who has been so generous in receiving it. I'm incredibly grateful to my agent, Russ Galen, for his amazingly helpful editorial feedback, and to everybody at Tor who believed in the book and made it better, Patrick Nelson Hayden, Miriam Weinberg, Irene Gallo, uh, Patty Garcia. I could just list people all night. Everybody at io9 who supported me when I was writing it. Uh, most of all, uh, my partner, Anna Lee Newitz, who I talk to every day when I was working on it, and who I feel like, you know, uh, she's at the center of everything I do. Um, but most of all, I'm just so grateful to all of you for, for believing in this book and for, you know, letting me get away with it. And, um, you know, it just means a lot to me. And I really hope that uh, me getting this means that maybe the next person who's arguing with the voices in their head that say they're not good enough to write the thing they want to write, <sighs> sorry, will actually tell the voices in their head to shut up and go and write their frickin' book. Thank you so much. Congratulations to all of the nominees and to all of uh, tonight's winners. Um, let's please welcome CIFWA President Kat Rambo back to the stage. I'm so glad this thing is almost over. <laughs> we have been working so hard on this, and by we, I say everyone else, while I just sort of stand back and go, wow, you guys are working real hard. <laughs> uh, one of the people who worked particularly hard is Mary Tabasco, who is responsible for the banquet that we had tonight. But thank you so much to all of the volunteers, to the staff, to the, just the amazing CIFWA team. But thank you to all of you for coming. And it, it really has been special. And I hope that it has been half as good for you as it has been for me. And hopefully a lot less anxious. <laughs> um, Stephen's going to come up and say a few kind of closing things with logistics. And my directive is to all of you, just go have a good time for the rest of the weekend. And I, it just, it's so lovely to see you all. Thank you all for joining us at this year's Nebula Award Ceremony. We'd like the award recipients to bring their trophies up to the photography area to pose for some pictures. Nominees who did not win this evening are welcome to remain in the room to give their alternate universe thank you uh, speeches. And everyone is invited to listen to the speeches or to head up to the hospitality suite, which is sponsored this evening by Tor and Tor.com. And also a reminder that the book depot will be open until whenever you're done buying books. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>